The Great Sphinx is among the Earth's greatest cultural mysteries. In the 1930s, self-styled prophet Edgar Cayce predicted that the secrets of the Sphinx would be revealed sometime in the 1990s. And Cayce, it turns out, may have been right. 10,500 BC, this is when the Sphinx is gazing directly at his own image, the constellation of Leo. And if we are to turn 90 degrees and face due south, we would see the three stars of Orion's belt in a pattern that mimics exactly the pattern of the pyramid on the ground. So we have here a perfect conjunction taking place only and only in 10,500 BC. But history books teach us that in 10,500 BC, our human ancestors were still in a primitive state incapable of the advanced astronomical and engineering skills necessary to build great monuments. We're suggesting that the entire foundation on which our notion of human history rests is faulty. I'm Mark Lehner and I'm here at the Great Sphinx of Giza on behalf of Dr. Zahi Hawass, helping him out um, on drilling that we're doing underneath the Sphinx. In, in, in our first uh, hole here will be underneath the uh, Sphinx's uh, left paw. Perhaps the most visible example of an advanced civilization in Egyptian prehistory is that the Great Sphinx itself. Although the head was quite obviously recarved in dynastic times, the body and the man-made courtyard in which it sits show signs of heavy water weathering. We think that all the indications suggest that a time capsule was deliberately concealed at Giza in Egypt with the intention that it should be found one day, a time capsule that would abolish all ambiguity over this matter and make it absolutely certain of what had gone before and of what we have forgotten. But a time capsule that was not intended to be found by barbarians, that was hidden away very carefully to be found, as the ancient texts say, by the fully worthy. Perhaps that's who we are. Perhaps that time has come. Perhaps that's the decision and the awe-inspiring prospect that we confront in the near future. The right to open the chamber under the paws of the Sphinx is something of a political game these days. And the Egyptian government is holding all the cards. Only they know when and if the secrets of the Sphinx will be revealed to the world. Over the past few years, we have touched upon many of the amazing and often extremely ancient sites which dot our Earth. Many of these spectacular achievements, indicating to the countless specialists, archaeologists, geologists, and others involved, attempting unraveling of their true history, their true story of antiquity. On several occasions, we have been confronted with compelling and often conclusive explorative analysis which has often resulted in the retrieval of compelling supportive artifacts which have supported the claim of them surviving past cataclysm, often accompanied by an ice age. Our sharing of this data has regularly received a mixed reception. The Sphinx, for example, which shows clear evidence of surviving this past event and subsequent ice age, which involved a flood event. We saw that many were interested in this premise, yet not convinced of such claims. However, a gentleman known as Mario Bildraps has taken this theory and, if confirmed to be correct in his preliminary findings, may have established it as a fact beyond all possible doubt. A link to his website will, of course, be in the description. Mario, it seems, has been very busy. He has correlated the orientation of over 500 ancient pyramids and temples randomly spread around the world to what he claims is a 99% accuracy to the temperature changes during the last glaciation cycles. Most ancient structures, therefore, he has concluded, are hundreds of thousands of years old and not just a few thousand. Many of the pyramids and temples have been renovated over the millennia, new structures forming on top of older foundations, while the orientation of these foundations remain unchanged. Chichen Itza and Baalbek are two good examples of this practice. He states that the proof is mathematically backed up from start to finish. He adds, the orientation of a building is purely mathematical, 
because orientation is dimensionless, or not materialistic. When we process the orientations of virtually all ancient buildings around the world, it reveals a profound discovery. He claims his research is so new, so innovating, that you won't find anything like this anywhere else, except maybe some copies of this original material on other websites. About 57% of the 501 randomly spread ancient structures that were involved in this research accumulate massively in five clusters of together just 20 degrees or 22.2% along the intersection line. This line is also a purely mathematical entity that runs from our current North Pole to our current South Pole along a longitude of 47.1 degrees west. It appears a big chunk of his research has been directed towards developing a cardinal reference line, an imaginary line drawn upon the globe which could be used to match ancient structures to a past location of the cardinal points. Of course, if his mathematics can be peer-reviewed and ultimately found to be correct, he could truly be on to something. His research will not only push back the theories involving the chronological development of man, but also prove beyond doubt pre-Columbian voyage up to a half a million years ago, among many other startling realities. The collective orientation of contemporary buildings points almost exactly at our current geographic pole. You might say that the collective unconscious orients itself to the geographical pole, or as many people would say, to the sun. The more data you gather, whether it's in a region, one country, one continent, or the whole world, the more obvious it becomes that contemporary buildings add up to the geographic pole. There is no contemporary culture to find that has a preference for a specific orientation other than a cardinal orientation. It is undoubtedly interesting research, which we implore you to peruse further. We will keep you posted on future developments regarding Mario's work. Egypt, undoubtedly one of the most controversial places for modern history to try to keep the control of in regards to its origin, its true age, or original builder. When one either visits the Giza Plateau and is lucky enough to gaze upon these three great pyramids, or merely able to peer upon them through their computer screens, the first thing that will usually cross one's mind is awe and amazement. Yet this is often instinctually followed by an air of wonder, a curiosity as to how these miraculous structures were built, who could have possibly built them, and most importantly of all, why. Yet these questions, and indeed the pursuit of their answers, has been a mission for many well-funded deceptive individuals, for many years, to work very hard to distract you from either asking or pursuing as personal line of inquiry. For example, the Golden Mask of King Tut, along with the many other undoubtedly spectacularly valuable artifacts encrusted with precious metals and jewels that can be seen littering Egypt in its many museums and in the mountains of literature, books, and touring exhibits, which are published, pushed, and permitted in regards to this spectacular area of human history. Grand Egyptian Museum late last month was an exciting event for archaeologists worldwide and a source of pride for Egyptians. We moved today the sixth and the last chariot of King Tutankhamun from the, from the military museum in the citadel, which was there since 1987, to the gem. So we were keen to show you the moving of this uh, very nice artifact and the packing and unpacking uh, method, uh, professional method you are using by my colleagues in the ministry. The Tutankhamun exhibit, comprising about 5,000 pieces, will display for the first time all of Tutankhamun's artifacts in one place. Experts from around the world have been consulted on how best to preserve and display the collection. When museum workers accidentally knocked off the beard of King Tut's burial mask in 2015 and hastily glued it back on, there were fears that modern chemicals would cause permanent damage to the artifact. But scholars around the world put their heads together to save the golden mask. The museum will also be a venue for international conferences on Egyptology. There is something new always. We found out today in my talk, the family of Tutankhamun through DNA, how Tutankhamun died, 
No one murdered him. My excavation in the Valley of the Monks that we are doing right now, important excavation looking for the tomb of Archis in Amun. Maybe soon a tomb will be revealed in the Valley of the Monks or the Western Valley of the Kings. Most of the artifacts in the Tutankhamun exhibit have been relocated from the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. Their new home is only about two kilometers away from the place where the young pharaoh's tomb was discovered in 1922. Egyptian officials say the gem will be the world's largest archaeological museum when completed and will hold about 100,000 artifacts in total. We have now 3,000 employees and workmen working inside the project. We are respecting our schedule. We'll be ready from the engineering uh, part by December 2018, and we are deciding now the perfect time or the ideal timing for the partial opening. In addition to King Tut's exhibit, the museum will display objects related to some of the greatest historic Egyptian kings, such as Ramses II, Akhenaten, and Amenhotep III. The ancient Egyptians, although claimed as ingenious, were merely adaptive. Just like the equally acclaimed Romans and Incas of Peru, these re-inhabitants merely rediscovered the creations of a far older, far more advanced predecessor, who I believe not only constructed these sanctuaries, which these well-studied ancient civilizations merely used to enable the flourishment of their own cultures, in turn, leaving a smorgasbord of architectural artifacts for funded academics to excavate and subsequently parade around, usually bombarding many individuals with deep insights into their lifestyles, culture, and death practices, are yet, as I would have predicted, nearly always absent, that which supports my posit. Any logical explanation or demonstration of how these people built these structures in which they once inhabited like a void in their academic study, one which is not only consistently ignored and concealed by these same academics, but are unknown facts to all of modern humanity to this day. This mystery is a result of the incredible nature of these structures, the precision involved in their constructions, and the enormity of some of the stones used in the building of the structures. Many of you may have seen my recent videos or be a keen follower of my work and, as such, are aware of the fact that due to my in-depth study of the unknowns regarding these sites worldwide and the collection and collaboration of the similarities and differentiabilities I have personally collected and categorized regarding many of these ancient structures, I have personally been able to establish a very strong, evidence-based hypothesis regarding the identity of three separate lost civilizations, which I have established using signatures within their style of building, and by default differentiations in their styles of building, to unquestionably identify them as separate yet particular groups responsible for the different unexplainable structures spanning the entire globe. Yet, although these groups have indeed crossed paths, such areas as Aswan Quarry and most significant to my own research in Italy, where the polygonal civilization built upon the Cyclopeans' work, allowing me to establish which preceded which, and although these groups have been established to have abandoned projects midway through, thus indicating that they came to a sudden and untimely demise due to cataclysm, the civilization responsible for the pyramids, and indeed the movement of the blocks at Baalbek in China, which all far exceed 1,000 tons, is yet another civilization which far predated all which I have already identified. These three civilizations are the Polygonal Civilization, the Cyclopean Civilization, and the Neolithic Civilization each with their own unique building techniques and identifiable stone-cutting signatures in their technologies. The pyramid builders were unimaginably more capable than all three, and although the Neoliths, who indeed have created some astonishingly advanced ruins, could have quite possibly been a surviving remnant of this civilization, this digression is for another time. Though at sites such as Baalbek, the trilithon, which contains stones over 1,000 tons, there are cyclopean stones built atop the stones, and at other places in the world polygonal masonry has been found, such as Aksum in Ethiopia, where the toppled obelisk is said by some 
to be in excess of 1,000 tons, I have never, and now strongly feel will never, find any indicative evidence of these civilizations building the footings under any of these gigantic megaliths, as they were not responsible for their creation or placement. Additionally, the civilization responsible for the pyramids, and these enormous megalithic blocks elsewhere, were also the civilization who created the false door. A mysterious rock-carved feature, also found littering the now-exposed mega-metropolis found beneath the Guatemalan rainforest by penetrative radar. Taikal, part of this metropolis, the place where the plaque illustrating a past global cataclysm was once found, also has pyramids built solely leading to these false doors, with one found in Peru, built into the only rock face containing a very peculiar crystal known for its resonance qualities in amplifying radio waves. I feel that much of the spectacles found in modern Egyptian museums are merely distractions from the really important truths which we should all be focusing on instead. Such as the true age of the pyramids, structures which, in the past, I have also independently identified as still possessing three separate identifiable stages of attempted casing stones for conservation, each significantly older or younger than each other, with the true exoskeleton of the structures made of stones far in excess of 1,000 tons. Join us next time, where I will expose the controlled opposition within the fringe fields of archaeology, which have stemmed from a growing pursuit for the truth of these facts, with a focus upon the water erosion hypothesis of the Great Sphinx, why it is a misdirection, and the Sphinx's true, original, undeniable identity, facts and truths exposed, which are undoubtedly highly compelling. Did the Great Sphinx once witness the bottom of a sea? There is evidence. Things we have covered on this channel in the past which would suggest just that. Who built these astounding structures found dotted all over the earth? When were they built? Were they really, like academia would like you to believe, built by primitive civilizations with the use of primitive tools, often made of copper and notoriously soft metal? Or is there a possibility that these structures were made by a far more ancient, far more capable, world-traversing civilization? Built in areas of geological interest, most often the center of a landmass or placed upon key lines? Although there is a large number of artifacts and archaeological factors which strongly suggest this exact scenario of events, we feel there is one collection of artifacts or rather evidence of this people's past existence, which, just like their clear originally intended function, could tie these monuments neatly together. Known as the missing ancient metal clamps, given their predicted age and metallic composition, the fact that they are no more should come as no surprise. However, the carved seats that these clamps once sat within are still present in the stonework of many ancient structures found all over the world. Within our own modern day society, a society that can travel the world in a day and speak to the other side in an instant, technological advances are often copied or shared between nations. The concepts being the same, yet the manufacture slightly differing in form and the metal clamps display this exact phenomena. Slight variations in manufacture that can be seen dependent on the landmass the ruin is found upon. Yet the concept behind the construction of these amazing and perplexing structures, often constructed using blocks we have no explanation as to the placement of, remain the same worldwide. Dry stone walling often accompanied by these clamps made with such skill, the blocks are now often perceived to have been made to measure. The clamps once functioned as seating clips, after the fresh construction of these stone structures, the builders were clearly very aware of shifting, which can be seen, as blocks settled over the following years. This offers a presumption that these structures were intended to last many centuries, if not millennia, and the metal clips were also designed to indeed rust away to nothing after their function was served. Amazingly, it seems that out of the countless thousands used, a few of the clamps have somehow managed to survive. The clamps from pre-Columbian South America that have been examined show them to be made of a very unusual alloy. 
2% arsenic, 95% copper, with traces of iron, silicon, and nickel. This composition is particularly interesting within Puma Punca because there is no source nickel anywhere in Bolivia. The cliffs are clearly a compelling link between these ancient structures found all over the world, but more importantly, the builders of them. These amazing artifacts clearly deserve much more attention. Thanks for watching, guys, and until next time, take care. An announcement that seemingly slipped us by was made recently within Egypt. This announcement pertaining to an amazing discovery made within an area of the Giza Plateau that for a number of decades has been conveniently shut off from the public. Although the location is claimed to be a military training base, archaeologists have apparently been secretly beavering away within this remote slice of antiquity. Announced by the Supreme Council of Egyptian Antiquities, Egyptian authorities have apparently found the mysterious traces of the legendary Fourth Lost Pyramid of the Plateau. This provocative announcement stirred up a gale of protest among many Egyptologists, and the reason for this may be because the discovery might turn out to be highly controversial. Although the pyramid is in a very bad state, and this may be due to its immense age, with only a few rows of blocks remain, and these surviving blocks clearly displaying evidence to indicate that the missing blocks have simply eroded away over the eons. This ruin may not be the most important find in the area, or indeed, the purpose for the video. Along with these pyramidal remains at the site is another amazing anomaly. In the middle of this mysterious desert, an enormous staircase has been found, plunging into the desert floor. Seemingly excavated before this announcement and left for those who were fortunate enough to get access to the area to rediscover and photograph. This enormous staircase plunges straight through a limestone basin many meters in depth. This surgical slice has revealed an astonishing implication. It has revealed that the Giza Plateau does indeed extend this far. Not only that, but it demonstrates the sheer, unimaginable cubic size of this area of stone. A block of stone that was apparently man-made. Where this staircase actually leads to is as yet unknown, although it is thought to drop far below that which is currently visible, and preliminary scans of the area are suggesting that it plunges through the plateau, deep into an ocean of groundwater below. By examining the pictures of the discovery, it appears that the site has indeed been excavated from the sand, having most likely been submerged from view beforehand. The question is, who did these excavations? Who built this unbelievable structure, or indeed, the mind-bogglingly enormous Giza Plateau? Who built the pyramids and sphinx upon it? Where did such an enormous stone plateau come from? How did they shape and carve such mysterious structures with such blocks? Or perhaps, most importantly of all, where does this staircase lead? Did whoever undertake this excavation task manage to discover where it led? More research and exploration will undoubtedly be undertaken over the next few years. We will, of course, keep you posted.